It's been almost two years since Seattle and King County declared a state of emergency over homelessness. A state of emergency is usually associated with natural disasters, but homelessness has become a human crisis as the number of homeless continues to rise not only here, but also elsewhere on the West Coast. Los Angeles, Portland, and Hawaii have also declared a state of emergency over homelessness. The 2017 homeless count in King County found another substantial increase from the prior year. This year's point in time count found some 11,600 people homeless with nearly 5,500 living on the streets, in motor vehicles, and tent encampments. Why is homelessness such a problem here? What are the factors behind the growing numbers? What needs to be done to address the problem? And what are the solutions? I'm Enrique Cerna and welcome to Mohai, the Museum of History and Industry here on South Lake Union. And joining us tonight to take up this challenging and complex issue are Mark Putnam, the director of All Home, the organization that conducted the 2017 point in time count of persons experiencing homelessness in Seattle and King County. Also with us is Sarah Vander Zaden, is uh, Managing Director of Facing Homelessness, a Seattle-based nonprofit that is also spearheading a new effort called the Block Project that we'll hear more about tonight. Colleen Echohawk Hayashi is here. She is the Executive Director of the Chief Seattle Club, a nonprofit dedicated to meeting the needs of homeless and low-income urban native people in Seattle. Colleen is also the founder of the Coalition to End Urban Native Homelessness. And Gary Cashman is here. He's a former Army Ranger who served in Afghanistan and Iraq. He has experienced homelessness, but he received help from the King County Veterans Program and now works at the Wounded Warrior Project, and he's helping his fellow veterans. And would you please give them a round of applause and welcome them. Thank you very much for being here. Well, let me begin with you, uh, Mark. Um, the, the count that happens now, it, it's changed. Uh, it is now kind of a point in time count. It used to be the one night count. I think this year they also called it count us in. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about how that has changed and, and why it changed and what difference has it made in, in trying to determine who is homeless and, and what it means in King County and Seattle. Sure. Um, yeah. And, um, thanks for all of, to all of you for coming out tonight. It's great to see so many people here to talk about this important issue. Um, each year, we we uh, it's really important for us to to count and know how many people are experiencing homelessness in our community for a number of reasons. Um, that's important. One is that that we're actually required to with with uh, for, to receive federal funding, um, and we just submitted an application yesterday for thirty six million dollars, and we wouldn't get that if we didn't do the count. Um, however, uh, I think there's a, a more um, organic reason that, that it's important and that it really brings the community together. We had almost 800 volunteers, including uh, almost 200 people who had experienced homelessness who helped do the count. They led each of the teams um, this year. Um, and the teams are essentially three, or three to four people um, that get a census tract um, and a map. Um, they go out uh, from 2 to 6 in the morning and, and go to an area and canvas it um, and do the best they can. And some, sometimes that's a rough terrain. Sometimes it's a really rainy night. Um, and obviously, it's a lot harder for the people we're counting than the people who are out there um, you know, volunteering. Um, we've made some changes this, this past year to the count. Um, we counted um, 11,643 people unsheltered. Um, or I'm sorry, that were homeless, including 5,485 that were unsheltered. The remainder were either in shelter that night or in a temporary um, homeless transitional housing type of program. And what differences did you find? I mean, we, we talk about Seattle and Seattle's part of King County, yeah. but difference in the city compared to being out further in the county? Yeah, there, there are definitely some differences, but, but there's a lot of similarities. And uh, we, we found that um, overall about 40% of people that were living in an unsheltered situation um, were living in a vehicle. Um, and that's a really, that number keeps growing. It used to be about 30%. Um, and, and so that, that number is growing. I think we're seeing that in the city of Seattle. Um, most, a lot of that increase was in the city of Seattle, but we see a lot in, out in the county as well. Um, in more rural areas, um, there is less shelter, um, and so you know that's a, that's a challenge for for people out in in those rural areas as well. 
we were talking earlier, and I think I did actually say experiencing homelessness, but you, you made a point to me that uh, in, in kind of describing the homeless, that yeah. that's, that, yeah, homelessness that's an important is, thing. Yeah, it's a, you know, we, we say, um, we refer to people who, uh, who are homeless as people experiencing homelessness because homelessness is a condition, not uh, a definition of who you are. Um, and so when, when people uh, describe the home, say the homeless or homeless people, um, it's, it's, you know, the, the, there's a lot more to that person, right? They're a, they're a son or they're a parent or they're a veteran or, you know, they have a lot of other qualities. Um, and so that's somebody who's experiencing homelessness. Let's talk about that a little bit more. I know, Sarah, um, you work with uh, the founder of Facing Homelessness, uh, fellow that I know well named uh, Rex Holbein, who's uh, done some really unique work. He was a former architect, has become a homeless advocate, and created the organization Facing Homelessness. But one of the things that he really has hit on is this idea of um, kind of the, the language we use mm -hmm. in, in talking about the homeless. And I know for Facing Homelessness, that's, it's a, an important thing. Talk about that some more. Yeah, uh, so thank you again, everyone, for being here. Um, facing Homelessness is essentially, at its heart, a messaging organization. We message about the issue of homelessness with a goal of inviting community to be a part of the solution. So everything that we do is to take this big, overwhelming issue and break it down um, into something that each of us feels empowered to impact. Um, so the language we use, we also use person-first language. Um, we also talk less about um, the systems and the policies and the politics and talk more about how we can engage your passions and skills to become a part of the solution. We feel strongly that we don't need to know the systemic solution to homelessness in order to begin. And we don't need to know how to solve the crisis someone is experiencing in order to reach out with compassion and just say hello. Um, that's, that's the messaging that's really important to that's us. That's a slogan, actually, with uh, facing homelessness is the idea of say hello to someone that you yeah. see on the street. Because I think too often that we, we tend to like shy away or we get nervous and instead of acknowledging someone, because they are human beings. Uh, Colleen, let's talk about um, y you know, the Native community. Yeah. Uh, I know that you're deeply concerned about how they're viewed when it comes to homelessness, not only just the Native community, but all people of color, yeah. because there is a growing number out there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I do also want to thank you all for being here. I just saw my husband walk in, so it feels like I can... <laughs> I'm, I'm at, I'm, I see he, some he was late, <laughs> by the way, so yeah, here we go. I see some familiar faces out here, too, and it's just good to know how much this community, the community of Seattle, cares about... Um, our homeless community, and especially um, care about our Native community. And I, and I see that when I go out and I'm talking to people about the high rates of homelessness um, amongst the Native community here in Seattle, people are asking me, what can we do? I had no idea. And it is staggering. Um, if you are a Native person and you live here in King County, you are seven times more likely to be homeless. We make up around 6% of the homeless population. And I have participated in the counts and being out there at night looking for folks and counting them. And I know that the folks that my agency serves every day, they're really good at hiding out and away from where those counts are. So I actually believe that number's a little bit higher and that we serve, maybe we have seven or eight to, um, percent of the homeless population that are native. And I'd like for all of us to remember that right now, we are in Coast Salish territory that this is Duwamish, Duquamish, Muckleshoot, Tulane. so many tribes were in this area. And to think that every night Native people are more likely to be homeless in this city, this city full of good people like yourselves who care deeply, who want to make a difference and a change. And I think that is so important for us to think about the systems and the structures that have set us up that Native people and people of color are more likely to be homeless. It's something Mark and I have discussed many, many times that um, we have high rates of homelessness in our African-American males. Um, if you are an African-American male and you are in the foster care system, your chances of becoming homeless are extremely high. It's 80%. 
that should make us all stop in our tracks and ask ourselves, what are the systems in, in our city, in this beautiful city of Seattle, full of wonderful liberal people, where our city has these systems and structures that set up that African American boys who are in the foster system will become homeless? And what can we do about it? Gary, um, you were homeless at one point. How did you end up there? Uh, that is a good story. I'll do the last part of thank yous, I guess. Thank you guys for showing up and, and listening to us <laughs> talk. So that's the last one. It should be from the panel. Um, it, it's an interesting, long story. I, my parents uh, went overseas. My dad ended up in Japan in the Air Force and retired back in the 70s. And I was born overseas, so I had an interesting set of hurdles in front of me coming back to the States. Uh, I was born in Tokyo, grew up on an air base there all 18 years of high school. Went in the Army, stayed overseas pretty much my whole career, besides basic training and a few schools here and there in the States. Uh, most of my time has been overseas, and then between Afghanistan, Iraq, Kosovo, all over the world. I got out overseas, stayed overseas, and I thought I was starting my transition process. Really, I just traded my shirt and uniform for a goatee and being able to say a little bit more stuff and go to lunch, because my transition really didn't happen. I stayed around the base. I stayed overseas for another 10, 15 years, working on base, being around a system that I understood. They provided things for me, provided stuff for you, especially when you're overseas. They pay for your housing, they pay for stuff, whatever you're doing. Uh, second divorce, that's a trade of the Army. We get married a few times, usually. Uh, the last divorce, Air Force gave me a ticket back to the States. Here you go, one-way ticket back. There you go, you got two days to get on the plane. No household goods. Uh, came back stateside, and it was a whole new world. Brand new world of just not understanding, all right, everybody has to fend for themselves. I was used to a fence. It's odd, but used to being around a fence. Used to pulling out my ID card everywhere I go everything I have to do. So coming back here was really kind of shocking, uh, not knowing how to have any rental history. I've had the government pay for everything for the whole time. Um, great jobs, I was at GS-12, GS-13, ran a couple of my own businesses, all other stuff overseas. Coming back to the States, realizing I can't even do my business that I've done in photography because of insurance and things I didn't have to do. Um, so really quickly kind of hit a spot of, I have no idea what to do. Let me see if I can figure this out on my own. That got harder and harder every day, where every time I went somewhere to apply for a house or an apartment, you don't have any credit history here in the States, you don't have any rental history here, you haven't been here long enough, I can't verify your address because the government gave me all my addresses and they don't even make sense. We have APO addresses, which means a secret little post office box in San Francisco, but it doesn't show up on any kind of zip code system. So as I apply for jobs, and we have the lovely ATS systems now, go to Boeing, got a lot of great experience at Boeing with different military contracts, and nothing comes back because I can't even get past the system of I don't recognize your zip code. I can't recognize your DSM phone number you've had for the last 10, 12 years. So it was really complicated to get back in the system because I had been gone for so long. It, it is what you experienced, then you served also in Afghanistan and in Iraq, uh, that experience too. Typical of what, now you work with veterans that are trying to adjust and go through all of this. Typical of yes. them trying to move back into the system or come back into our lives and our, our world now? Yes, it is very, very typical. Um, oddly, today, working on a case with a private, he's a PFC E3, been in for a few years, injured his foot, he's gonna get medically retired. Problem is that poor young man is not gonna be able to file for unemployment easily because they just see the system as seeing retired. Not that he's 24 years old and doesn't have savings, he just got finished with the Army and they can't use him anymore. That'll be a difficulty for him. I talked to him today, he found a couple of apartments, yet he can't get in because he's not out yet but then they can't help him with the services until he's homeless, so I'm trying to prevent it. He doesn't know how to navigate it because the government's giving him everything and he doesn't know what to do. And the people that are helping him get out, and that's not intentional, most of them haven't been out yet. So it's very confusing, the information you get versus what you see when you get out. And so it's very, very typical. A lot of guys are, are kind of lost in the sauce for a little bit and it takes a few times to fall down and get back up. And so I try to share my story as much as possible of letting me out of my car, doing what I gotta do to survive, having the right mindset to get back on track. And if I can let them learn from my mistakes, and that's just one last person that's going to be homeless. Mark, let me come back to you, because I think as we're hearing here, and, and this is, to me, kind of eye-opening, I think. And this, when I do these conversations, I learn so much, um, that there can be a lot of stigmas about people that are living on the streets or in an RV or in a, you know, in a tent encampment. Um, some people say, well, they don't want to work or they're lazy, mm -hmm. uh, they want to be homeless. Mm -hmm. All right, address those things for me, because I, I think as we're hearing here now, we know that there's, there's so much. As I said, it's complex. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I'd be happy to bust some myths. Um, <laughs> thanks for asking. Um, I think it's important to do so. I mean, I think it's. I think there is a characterization that happens, and uh, um, and I, I suppose it's natural. People people generally tend tend to do that. But um, you know, one of the things you know, one of the things you said is you know people don't work, um, and what we know is that um, job loss was the leading cause of homelessness among the people that that we surveyed in in that count in in January. Um, that was the leading cause of, of people becoming homeless. And, and the two things that people say they need in order to get back on, into housing and, and back on, on stable footing um, are the same things that we all need, or it's housing and a job. Um, so they, they asked, they, so they needed rental assistance and they needed some you know, job training or help finding, finding a job that could pay wages that, that could get them into housing here. Um, so that, those are a couple. I think you know, another that we often hear is that people are moving here. Um, that this is not a homegrown problem, but that people are moving here uh, um, as people who are homeless, and maybe other cities are shipping people here. Um, that's, a, that's actually something that you know, I, I meet a lot with people working in other cities um, around the country. In fact, we have a, a West Coast Cities Alliance that, that meets and, and talks about these issues. Um, and, and there's a lot of that sort of um, belief that people are, are, are moving from city to city. But we, you know, when we did this survey, only 5% of people experiencing homelessness said that, um, that they had come here for some services. Um, and we know that some people are coming from outlying areas um, that don't have as many services, and, that, and that's likely to happen. Um, but I, I think overall, um, about 80% of people um, experiencing homelessness now were housed in King County when they became homeless, and then another 15% in the surrounding counties, in King Pierce and Thurston and Kitsap counties. So Sarah, facing homelessness is, is based in the university district. Mm -hmm. So I take it you see a lot of young people. What are the stories that you see? What do you hear? But I also know it's not just that, but yeah. you know, from, from your vantage point, what do yeah. you hear? We do see a lot of young people in the U District. I was actually just this weekend having a conversation with a good friend, um, and she's a liberal, enlightened person, and was shocked to learn that a lot of the people we serve were once, not that long ago, students at UW. And either a student loan didn't come through, or a, a parent didn't come through. Uh, oftentimes, I describe that the only thing that separates me from someone who is homeless is that I have a strong support network that wraps around me in times of need. I have a mom who would fly across the country in a heartbeat. Um, and people who are living outside, often it's intergenerational. We know so many young people whose parents are also homeless. Um, and a lot of the people we see are, are, are young and, and they have nowhere to turn. Um, and it's, we see again and again that the longer people are outside, the, the more likely it is that they're going to stay outside. I think that's statistically true as well. Um, but right when I started at Facing Homelessness just over a year ago, I met a woman named Sharon who um, is in her early 20s. She was planning to live in her car for a couple months and get on her feet. Here we are over a year later, and she's so entrenched in, in homelessness now, and her path out is much harder. I want to work in uh, Leonard Garfield. He's uh, the main guy here at Mohai and kind of our, our historian, always uh, giving us perspective on many of the issues. Um, in this area, homelessness, it's, it's nothing new. It's not a new problem, Enrique. In fact, Colleen reminds us that we're on sacred ground of the Duwamish. Our first peoples were the first homeless because when the European American community came in, the first rule that was passed was that native people had to leave the city. We forced homelessness on a population. And if you go through Seattle history, in the 1880s, it was the Chinese who were excluded and forced into ships in Elliott Bay. Um, if you go into the 20th century, you look at the Japanese American internment. Uh, the, the street kids in the 70s and 80s who were the focus of so much homeless conversation. It's really a question of how do we define who belongs here? Who do we allow to make this our home? And historically, race, economics, power has played very important roles in determining who has a home and who is excluded from home. Is it this, this revolving type of history then? Well, I'm inspired by our panelists that we can find a solution, and it begins person to person, and then it looks at the larger systems. But I think we do need to be mindful that our history is one of 
intentional and planned homelessness, and sometimes turning a blind eye to the issue that's right in front of us. But we're a community that always embraces smart solutions. I hope we can find a smart solution for this problem. We're going to get to those, uh, talking about some of the solutions. Like, Colleen, I want to come back to what, what Leonard mentioned, and that yeah. is that, we, as you mentioned as well, we're on native ground and yeah. sacred ground. And ha but has this become part of the, uh, unfortunately, the native experience in, in too many urban areas? Yeah, unfortunately, we see high rates of indigenous homelessness, not just here in our city, but in our state and in our country. Native people have high rates of homelessness, and actually internationally. So about two and a half years ago, we started the Coalition to End Urban Native Homelessness, and we recently have changed that to ending urban indigenous homelessness, because we're getting calls from places like Auckland and Honolulu asking us, like, you know, we have these problems as well, where our indigenous population are, are are struggling and suffering because they are outside. And what are you guys doing? And so we are a response to that. And part of our response is education, is letting people understand, or helping people understand why we're in this situation. You know, there, there's three things that come to mind right away. One, we, many people were forced out of their reserve um, were forced out of their traditional homelands and into reservations. Then children were taken from um, their families and put into boarding schools. And that was, um, started a whole problem where many children, in fact, children um, are, who are now um, adults that I serve at the Chief Seattle Club, um, they were taken from their families and were never reconnected. And so they in, in, ended up merging into cities like Seattle. And Anchorage. Anchorage has a lot of homeless Native people there. And then also, we have the Urban Relocation Act in 1956 that moved people, um, moved people off of the reservations, Native people, and into the cities. And they were often provided housing, and they were provided a job. But if you lost that housing, and you lose your job, and you don't have your security around you, your net, your tribe, your people who are going to back you up, many people at that time became homeless, and homeless here in Seattle. And so um, we, um, as Native people are really taking back our responsibility to house and, and find homes and security for our people. Um, I know that, um, you know, 200, 300 years ago, my, 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 my tribe was always housing our people. We had 100% rates of housing. We knew how to do it. So we're reclaiming that sacred responsibility to house our Native population. There are many wonderful Native organizations here in Seattle, um, including my own, that are building our low-income housing. So I'm hoping um, in four years from now, we'll have built 80 units of housing in Pioneer Square, and I'll invite you all to the ribbon cutting, because it is going to be incredible. Yeah, it'll be great. So Gary, you had your own challenge in that adjustment, which I take is, is a story that it's very typical for many of the veterans. Tell me about the work that you're doing now in trying to help the veterans as they transition, um, and the challenges, and uh, how, uh, how successful yeah, the, the um, might be. It, it's been difficult, and it changed with every veteran. I know some of it comes from you, you move around duty station to duty station, then you decide to get out, or you get injured, and then you're put out. And sometimes you don't get to go home. Uh, they might have left their home to come to the military to get away from where they were at. So they don't go back to home. Uh, they're displaced. They get out, they come here. Um, I had a young gentleman that he cracks me up every day. He was working at Home Depot, didn't have a place to stay, so he was staying in the storeroom in the back. Management didn't even know it at night. Thankfully, there was an amazing manager there named Scooter that called me up and said, hey, I got a homeless vet sitting in the back, and I do not want to fire him because I know how hard it is to get another job. I said, cool. Went down there and went to Warrior Project for us, you know, picked up the credit card and put him in a hotel for a month to sustain him for a little bit until I could figure it out, and then I had to walk him through, luckily, through my experiences of using the services to get, you know, I got basically three months of rent, never went back to the system after that just to get myself stabilized, and King County gave me a great job and got me to where I'm at today through a, through a program they have for veterans. And the thing for him was, I had to teach them, hey, I can get you into a, into a hotel, but to get the services through King County that you need to get, you're gonna have to become homeless. So I'm gonna have to move you from that to a shelter. And it's hard to take a combat veteran that's got a lot of pride to say, you're gonna have to go into a shelter, buddy. I, I know you don't wanna go, and I would love to keep paying for this hotel room for you, but for you to be able to get access to the services of King County Vets, I have to get you to go into a shelter. But he did it, Stone did it, was there for about two months, got him a house, King County helped him out, he's got a place, and every time I see him on Facebook posting some new furniture or something like that, it's a guy that, and he's a teacher, certified teacher, before he came in the Army. Great skill sets, he just got out and then got lost in how to manage his money, how to, 
have the money to live in Seattle, and then next thing you know, you're, you're behind in a car or you're sleeping in a parking lot and you get a ticket for that. And then that, that's another worry that you have and how do you sleep at night? And if you've already got PTSD from combat, you, know, you get two or three minutes of night of sleep because you're waking up every couple minutes, turning your car on and moving it, you know, um, and really just working with them to get the mindset straight and make sure they understand the pitfalls of the civilian world and how to balance. And a lot of some veterans, I, they don't like what I tell them. They're like, hey, but we are the 1% that joined, so we need to have help. I'm like, yes, you're right. And I'm with you. I volunteer just as well. But it is a lot easier mathematically for 1% to reintegrate to 99 than 99 to understand the one. So they don't like what I say, but they do get it down the road that I'm telling you from my pains that this is what you need to do. This is how it works when you get out. These are the steps you need to follow, and you'll, you'll go through it on your own. But it's really letting them know you really have to shift your mindset completely. Maybe the Army needs to put a bunch of huggers on the way out the door, but you get about a week or two to get out of the military sometimes. Sometimes you're out in two days. You weren't prepared to have that transition sometimes yet, and they haven't figured it out. It's really, at the end of the day, sad to say, but it's not the military's job to transition us. We are war fighters. We're, we're there to go protect. So they do fail. And Washington State, though, is amazing. Is the one state that actually has a military transition coalition where all four branches are talking to each other saying, we do not understand how to transition military members because we are actually active duty. So we need you veterans and you other organizations outside that understand this and deal with them to let us know how to fix it. So it is amazing that this is the one and only state that has a transition council to try to figure out how to fix it. Mark, uh, we're here on South Lake Union in an area that where we've seen just, you know, this big boom of growth here in the city. And uh, we talk a lot about um, oh, the, uh, just not only the growth, but the economic impact that it's had here, all of these types of things. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people are still wondering, why then are we having an increase in homelessness when we have this prosperity here? Sure. Yeah, but, you know, the causes... Um the causes of homelessness are, are deep, and we've spoken about some of them, some of the racial inequities, um, some of the, the pattern, really, of moving people um, from place to place and the, that, that displacement and what that causes. And I think, you know, you can also look at it from a very academic um, uh, perspective, and, and there have been studies that show, you know, the le leading determinants of, of, of homelessness in a, in a community, not just for a person, but just in a community, are things like um, rising rents, um, uh, rapidly rising rents, rapidly rising population, um, sounding familiar, um, <laughs> it, the, uh, you know, that changing, de those changing demographics and just people moving around causes a lot of, a lot of flux and obviously the cost. Um, also states that have um, uh, sort of weaker safety nets, um, so less funding for uh, mental health and, and substance use treatment. Um, and, and services like that. And our state has, a, has the, as many of you know, I'm sure, um, the most regressive tax um, structure um, uh, in the country. And so the poor in Washington State and in Seattle and in Auburn and Kent pay more in taxes than, than, um, than anywhere else in the country. Um, and they pay, they pay a much higher percentage, of course, of their, their actual take-home income um, than do wealthy people in our community. So it's really kind of turned upside down. And all of those, all of those causes, and I'm missing a bunch of them when you think, at, think about um, how people leaving the correction system are you know, excluded, um, or you know, they go from locked up to locked out of housing. Um, from jobs, um, so there are a lot of factors um, that really that really play into that. And I think in communities like Seattle, like San Francisco, like Los Angeles, um, Honolulu, um, I think the biggest driver right now, however, is the cost. It's the cost of housing, and most people are losing their housing because they can't afford it, or not able to get into housing because they can't get that foot, that sort of you know they can't grab the the bottom rung. Is is this a West Coast problem? It's not only a West Coast problem, um, but it, um, we are seeing that um, West Coast cities are experiencing homelessness, and particularly um, uh, they're, they're experiencing higher rates of homelessness and more people experiencing homelessness, and also um, particularly unsheltered homelessness. Um, some people say that's due to the weather. I say that's due to the housing costs because Florida has pretty nice weather. Um, when there's not a hurricane, um, and their, their housing costs are much lower and they have much lower rates of homelessness than Hawaii or California, Oregon, Washington. Let's talk about uh, some of the things that are happening to try to address the, the problem and, and try to make some changes. And one thing that is happening that's unique is the block project that Facing Homelessness has taken on. Uh, Sarah, tell us about 
about this project, how it came to be, and, and uh, you've got one person with a block home. Tell me about it. So the block project is building 125 square foot homes that are designed to be completely off-grid and also completely self-sufficient with running water and electricity um, in residential backyards. Um, so just in your average Seattle backyard, there could be a home for someone who is um, experiencing homelessness. And um, the block project is really a result of something we've been doing as an organization for the past seven years, um, which is oddly running a Facebook page. Um, we started, our whole organization started as a Facebook page, sharing beautiful photos and stories of people who are experiencing homelessness with a simple purpose of showing their beauty and inviting the community to connect to this big issue just through connecting to one person and being able to think, gosh, she reminds me of my sister or my best friend, and suddenly it doesn't feel so scary. Um, and often when we make these posts, we make an ask or a request on behalf of the person um, of the community. So things like, this is Sally, and she's living in her car, and if she doesn't have $300 for her tabs, um, in the next 48 hours, her car is gonna get towed, and she's gonna lose her home and all of her remaining possessions. Um, we've made posts for motel vouchers so that people can get well after having a cold for three weeks. Um, we've made posts for mentorship so that people can get into job fields that they're interested in. Every single time we've made a post with a request, and there have been thousands over the years, it has been met by the community often within an hour or two, and often with surplus. We just made a post asking for $2,400 to help with back rent for someone who is actually in our donor database who experienced a turn of events and was on the brink of homelessness with their three kids. Um, and overnight, between 10 o'clock p.m. and 6 o'clock a.m., $18,000 came in mm. for this person. Um, it was incredible. and it's. Mm -hmm. That was a large sum, but the, the result is not something that we, we see it all the time. And we've been learning that when the community is invited to be engaged and to be a part of the solution, they come rushing forth with compassion and with resources. And so we decided, how, how can we maximize the impact of this trend? Let's provide housing and let's invite the community to do it. Um, so we have built our first block home. Um, we just announced this project in March, um, started rolling it out in July, and are housing our first person this month. Um, the man's name is Robert. He is absolutely the sweetest uh, gentleman you'll ever meet, just turned 75. Um, he has a beautiful friendship with Kim and Dan, who are our first hosts. Um, and Robert was referred to us um, through Chief Seattle Club. He's a native man, um, and we are working with agencies around the city to refer clients into the Block Project. Um, it is, as far as we know, the first integrated solution in the city of Seattle, and that is why we believe in the model. It's, it's building that wraparound care, that support network that people living outside do not experience on the streets pushed to the fringes. Um, and we believe it'll be beautiful for the whole community. Talk a bit about Robert, or is it Bobby that he goes Bobby, by? Yeah. yeah. Well, he is an amazing human. I wish you could all meet him. He just would be smiling, he's beaming <laughs> all the time. He's just a really wonderful person. He is 75 years old and um, experienced homelessness only 10 years ago and has been living in a, in, in a, in a place where he was warm at night but it was a shelter and it was hard on him. He's um, an elder and every morning he would come down to the Chief Seattle Club, which is a day center for native people who are experiencing homelessness. And uh, he is one of these kind of folks who really wants to have some way to give back. So the way I got to know him, um, as the executive director, I don't get to do face-to-face -face time with people all the time, right? And, but the way I got to know him is that every morning he would come by offering the staff, including myself, breakfast. Um, before getting any breakfast for himself, he would make sure that the staff around the building were getting a meal, and that's how I got to know him. And when um, we started having conversations with Sarah and Sarah and Rex and the team at Facing Homelessness, um, and we started thinking about this blog project, I think that one of the things that came to my mind right away 
was when can I get one in my backyard? And I um, you know, I'm a homeowner in North Seattle, and I know the homeless community, and I, I can't wait until my husband and I and my kids get to have someone who lives in our backyard. We gotta get rid of our play structure first, but um, because I believe so deeply in the goodness of our homeless community. And one thing I, I say all the time about the native homeless community, but also just the general homeless community, with so many people who are in so much trauma and facing so much hardship every single day that their voice is not able to be heard, they're not able to be the, their fully functioning selves that they should be, what are we missing as a community when their voice is silent? I believe that they hold the solutions to some of the problems in our city, some of the problems in our world. And so I cannot wait to, to elevate that voice and bring them in. And Bobby is a perfect example of someone who offers so much joy and goodness and wants to serve people and wants to um, share his life with you. And he was like the perfect person to uh, be involved in this project. And so um, I'm thrilled to think about um, this beautiful man, an elder, 75 years old, to be moving into his own home with his own shower, his own bathroom, his own bed, where he'll be able to be safe at night. How, about, how big is the home, and, and how was it designed? And, and uh, tell us about that. So the homes are 125 square feet, um, and they're beautifully designed. Rex, as Enrique mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, is an architect. He did high-end residential design for 28 years. Um, and this small home looks like high-end residential design. <laughs> it's very modern, um, completely powered by solar. Um, to, when the solar panels went up, it was just a moment of like, oh my gosh, this is a model for how we should all be living. Um, it's, it maximizes its use of space. Um, there's, it's kind of like a, a fancy motor home in that it has a um, the table pulls down when the bed is pushed in, and um, it's beautiful. It's utilizing incredibly efficient materials, triple pane windows shipped here from Poland. Um, all of the labor um, to construct these, the first block home and all of the future block homes is donated um, by general contractors and subcontractors. Turner Construction is, it's safe to say, the reason we have a block home right now. They're volunteering so much time um, in management and expertise to get these things built and to make them increasingly panelized and prefabricated so that they can go up quickly. But a big key out of this is the fact that you, you had a couple that was willing to open up their backyard to do that, and uh, which is something, you know, not everybody wants to do this. I've moderated conversations throughout the city on, on this issue, and there's a lot of nimbyism not in my backyard. Yeah. This couple was willing to do this, uh, and even, but there was also a lot of talking to the neighbors, right? Mm -hmm. So Kim and Dan are our first host family, and they, we believe, are setting a new precedent and shifting the paradigm to yes in my backyard. Yes, you can live in my backyard. You can share in our space and in our life. The Block Project has been compared to Airbnb. Um, in the way that it challenges us to reimagine our use of personal space. Our backyards can be platforms for social justice instead of places for play structures. Um, and uh, Kim and Dan are not the only people who have stepped forward. They were the first, and that was huge. But now more than 50 people have come forward, and we haven't asked yet. We're, we don't even have, we're not even ready. Um, but it's a, it's a good problem to have. Um, I, and I haven't even told you this yet, but I had someone like reach out to me and said, do you know someone of the blog project? Because I want the next one in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> and and it is a, it's a community effort. It's called the Block Project because we don't want just the host to be engaged. We want the whole block to be engaged. There's something that we all have to offer, even if you, know, you can be a condo dweller, an apartment dweller, and still offer something valuable to the Block Project and to our homeless population. Um, when we uh, first started engaging with Kim and Dan, the first step, and it, it will be the first step always, is to go to the block and talk with them about um, the block project and invite them to be a part of it, whether that means bringing over leftover lasagna or offering to run a load of laundry or just stopping to say hello and start a conversation, sharing your life with Bobby. Um, 
we, we feel that it's really important to engage the whole community and to see this as healing for all of us who live in isolation. We did invite Kim and, our, to be, Kim and Dan to be here, but I, maybe they got caught up in the traffic. Uh, they didn't make yeah. it, right? Okay, unfortunately. Uh, but but uh, let me turn to you, Mark. This is just one solution. There's Talk about what else we need. Sure. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think um, I, I'm often asked that question, but tonight I'm struck by, like, you know, what we need are leaders, like the three of them, like, you know, doing, doing the things that they're doing. We need more people to get engaged and, and come up with their ideas or join the existing efforts because um, it, really, it really does take the entire community, and I think it will take the entire community. This problem is not... Um, about um, you know just passing a levy or we need that uh, it's it's you know it's not about passing or electing the right people we need to do that too um, but it's about you know rolling up your sleeves sometimes and coming up with ideas and implementing them and there's countless um, people that we can all think of that are doing really cool things yeah. um, that have been for decades some people um, and and organizations and then some really new ones um, as well I think overall um, you know, we need, uh, we, you know, I said the problem was housing costs, we need to address that. And, um, and it's only, you know, only the, that's the biggest issue. But, um, and I, I think um, at the state level, we need more funding. We've been saying that, we've been saying um, that about the federal government as well. Um, I think a lot of communities on the West Coast, I'll keep coming back to that, are really increasingly turning um, and saying, yeah, we need those things from the state and federal government and we need to keep asking. They're not coming very quickly, <laughs> and the, the issue is in front of us, and our, our neighbors are homeless, and we need to do things locally like um, expand, um, expand affordable housing, um, change zoning, um, get, get the resources in to really address the problem for people tonight while also building those long-term solutions. I want to mention to our audience here, if you have a question or comment that you would uh, like to address to our panel here, uh, Come on up here, create a little line, and I'll work you right into the conversation. So please, please uh, join us. We want you to be a part of this conversation. Uh, I want to bring in uh, Tamara Kohler. Tamara, Tamara, where are you? Where did I, where did I put you? There she is, <laughs> right behind me. Um, you know, uh, you are the division director of the uh, Homeless Strategy Investment Division with the City of Seattle Human Services. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about money here, or at least it was touched upon, and, and that's an important issue. Um, what, how much is going toward trying to deal with this problem? Uh, and uh, is, you know, how much can we afford to do? I appreciate the opportunity to speak, and I think that you set the table so well, because I'm very honored to be part of the Human Service Department, because this is a human condition we're experiencing. And it does take investment. It does take the city really investing their dollars. And right now, Seattle has about 50 million that we've invested, and we continue to increase that. It's increased over the last four years. Uh, Mark hit on some of the need from federal dollars. We've had some reductions there, and we've had some um, willingness of the city's government to step up and fill some of those. But with that kind of an investment, 50 million of it, about half of it goes to emergency services. Our emergency shelters, our day centers, our hygiene. Uh, we also know that our emergency shelter system is not sufficient and not doing enough partly because we really don't have the housing to move people into. We also have had this large increase in an unsheltered population. So about a third of our funding goes to support those who have already moved into housing. So a person who's had an episode of housing and then is now stably housed, we also need to support them. We have found, um, as our panel has so eloquently said, you need that support system. And so we have some investment in that. And then we've also looked at about 15% of that money goes into prevention dollars or diversion from the system. If we can get to people early so they don't have to come into the system, that's where we're investing. But we have found with this leadership and a, a real desire to also tackle the unsheltered population. As Mark said, cities along the West Coast are seeing this high unsheltered population and really reassessing our shelter system. So new investments have been made in 
24-hour shelters that will bring in populations who can bring their pets, they can come as couples. We have some barriers to getting into to shelters just to move into the housing. And then also we have uh, our encampments and we have really done some work around that to put what we've called sanctioned encampments on city property and bring case management to where people are. And we're actually housing people out of those encampments as well. So I think it's important in government that we remember the people that we serve and the stewardship we have of the people's dollars and how important these investments are. And we need to approach people where they're at so these encampments have been an important investment. We also have a new piece that is in the proposed budget around the vehicle residency piece, which you have spoken about, which is a population that we need to address as well. So we're continuing to rethink and, and reinvest, but we need the housing to connect those people too. And we also have a, a navigation center that uh, is also modeled after what's, what's been going on in the Bay Area. Um, how is that working and uh, is it, is it, do we need more than one of those? The interesting piece with the Navigation Center is, is that 24-7 shelter. It's a low barrier. You can bring your pets and uh, it's about 75 beds and it's been up and functioning for about 60 days. But what we're finding is it is really bringing in a population that traditionally would not come into shelter. So is it the expectation that we'd get the right population in? Yes. And are we able to connect a population that has not connected with some of those services? Yes, and we need more. We need more of those type of beds that connect a very vulnerable and sheltered population to, to really working back into understanding how to work in a system, how to work in housing, how to store their property, how to be treated in a way that we can have conversation to solve those problems. So it, I believe, is a very successful endeavor, um, very challenging to cite those and place them and have the neighborhoods really understand the importance of them and for us to meet the commitments around it. We need more of those 24-hour that will bring anybody in off the street to really work to end homelessness. Thank you very much. Um, as I noted, we are a city where we have tremendous growth and economic development going on here. And I think and there's definitely been a lot of conversation as to developers and those that have, uh, uh, that have brought uh, the companies that have brought the wealth here. And where do they play a role in all of this? Your thoughts? Uh, because I think uh, as much as we appreciate the economic growth, um, it has added to the issue and, and the problem. So does there need to be a change there? What kind of change would you like to see as far as uh, that, Colleen? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. And um, you know, I don't know if I have a definite answer, but I have my own experiences with um, some of our companies here in the region because I do most of um, our, our fundraising <laughs> is comes through corporations and foundations, and I see a lot of willingness to want to come and jump in and address the situation. And I think that um, as we, we need to find the right kind of um, mechanism so that the, or, that the companies feel like they're connected to the mission. And I see that um, going on at Amazon, and I have a new community out engagement director that's been already talking with us. And um, you know, in my neighborhood down in Pioneer Square, we have Warehouser that just moved in. They immediately reached out and said, how can we participate? How can we be a part of the solution? So um, I think that there's more, of course, so we always want to see them um, do more, but I see some real willingness to step forward. And um, again, we just um, want to find ways to encourage um, more of it, so. Mark, you want to touch on that? Anybody else want to touch on that? Go ahead. Yeah, um, I'd say, especially in the Seattle, I work with a lot of companies like Amazon. I do employment now for the veterans, so trying to get them back to work. It's a heavy battle. A lot of veterans think they need to get a job and they deserve a job because they're veterans, and I have a half part of that saying that's correct, but you also need to be able to do the job. But when you've got huge companies that are coming in and taking up lots of land, and then they are building great centers down in Auburn and Kent, fulfillment centers, it's hard to get a veteran that is homeless on $14 an hour back to work. <clears throat> the hard part is you have an $800 HUD vest voucher. Right now the county has 300 veterans with HUD vest vouchers in their hand worth $800, but the landlord knows he can get 1300 bucks for it. How do we fix that small gap? Maybe it's creating places where they'll say, I've got five units, they will accept the HUD vest voucher, but we have a lot of guys that have the ability to get back on their feet right now but they can't get someone to accept that voucher because they know they can make an extra $100 on it, and that's gonna be something we have to figure out together. 
what's the, what do we got to do? What do the companies need to put into it? Maybe it's a tax break to incentivize them to do other things. We've got a great unemployment for veterans program in Washington State that got passed that gives companies huge tax breaks just locally. But there's other caveats that are problems where we have to prove that he's been unemployed for 30 days. But if a guy doesn't go to unemployment, we don't recognize him. So companies have great abilities to really kind of step in and help out. It's just really starting, I think, at the ground level and not making the solution too big. Just start small and then get something rolling. Otherwise, we could talk for days and days and we never get anything launched. Just pick something easy. Yeah, I think that th the thing that I would say is that we, we have seen a lot of great investment and partnership from um, the business community, and we have a long tradition of philanthropy being a part of the solution here with the United Way of King County and the Gates Foundation, Rakes Foundation, I could go on. Um, I think that's been fantastic, and um, there are parts of the solution on all different sides. I think what we really need right now is we have, you mentioned the, pe the veterans with, uh, with the rental assistance. Um, they, people, there's a thousand people at least that have a rental assistance um, voucher right now, have the opportunity to rent a unit. They have enough funding in that voucher. They might, there might be a gap for some people. Um, they can't find a place to like cash that voucher. They can't find a landlord to take that um, because there's so much competition for the units. Um, and so we are, you know, if you're a landlord that, um, you know, is thinking about this, the, the block project is one way to, to house somebody. There are also uh, units in the community and thousands of them and, and um, people experiencing homeless need, homelessness need access to those. Um, we, if you're a landlord, and you know, we'd love to hear from you. Question here. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, my name is uh, Miss Richard, first name Marguerite, uh, better known as Queen Pearl. And so I'm holding this flyer here because it says housing for all. And I don't believe that. I'm from here, from the city and from the state. And I, I see a lot of racism and discrimination going on. And when I look at you, I say, well, who are these people that are making the decisions for us? We, have been, we as black people have been told not to come to these meetings and get in front of people like you because you don't seem to have the answers. Burgess... At, in his speech, just mentioned Black Lives Matter. He mentioned it, but I don't know if he knows that a Black life, uh, life matters to him. And so do Black Lives Matter to you as far as homelessness? Because that panel is not exemplified of that. I think we have touched on the issue of yeah, the communities of color. It's time out for us looking at stuff that don't look like us and not treating us the same way everybody else gets treated. <laughs> Okay. Are you laughing? No, no, I'm not laughing because I think you're right. That's why. I'm, and I'm, and I'll, I'll, if I can, just, I have a quick sure. answer to that. I think you're totally right. It's something that um, I have no control over as a native woman, I am trying to do my best to eliminate that. And actually, I looked at Mark because at the, or at the uh, state conference on ending homelessness, um, I wrote a proposal that, that, that addressed that very issue. Why do we have so many white males making decisions on behalf of, of a population of color? And I have to give every, every prop to, to Mark, my friend Mark here. As I said, Mark, I wrote this proposal. Will you co-present with me <laughs> as a white male who's, making, who's helping make decisions? on behalf of people of color. So we absolutely have to address that issue. We have to see um, our um, African-American um, brothers and sisters coming to the table and leading these discussions. We need to see more folks from our, um, our Pacific Islander and Asian population coming forward too because we have solutions, but we need to be heard. I see it, uh, you know, I've only been back in the States for four years, but I've seen this city be willing to actually take me and put myself, you know, I've gone from homeless to working for $13 an hour, 30 hours a week, learning, okay, that's my new baseline. If something ever happens to me, I think about it every day. Cool. Every day I look at a gentleman that's 70 years old sitting at a Target going, you know what? And I tell my veterans every day, don't sit there and ask for free stuff every day. Look at that young man, that young man, he's 70 years old. He knows what he has to do to live. And I try to teach him that you are doing what our logo is. We have a guy carrying somebody else that's injured. We want you to get on your feet, pick up somebody else and take care of him. But this city has provided me the ability to get back on my feet, get housing, and now I'm on the King County Veterans Advisory Board so I can make decisions to affect, because I've been impacted. And then as far as being on the levy board, I'm proud to be able to be on a panel of other people from the Human Services side and the veteran side to be able to figure out how do we dictate how this money's gonna help people out best and starting off with the county being able to say, you know what, we're gonna bring a guy that was homeless who's gonna be willing to say what he wants to say, and they know I'm pretty blunt, because I'm speaking from, I've walked through the shoes, and I've told it to numerous people that, great idea, I walked through it, doesn't work they're willing to step out and say, hey, we need to figure something out, so let's bring some folks onto the panels and these boards that have walked through it. So it is a start. It's a start of listening to people that have been through the problems. 
Hey, come on up. All right, thank you. So I have, I've actually had two thoughts. My name is Megan and I, um, I volunteer as a writer for Real Change. And one of the things that I've learned is that there is a ban on rent control in, in the city of Seattle. And so I'm just wondering, um, one of my thoughts is, do you think that lifting that ban would help and so that would enable our city to have rent control? And then my other thought was, when I am um, doing research for the articles that I write for Real Change, I come across, and we've addressed this also, um, just the breakdown in community, that that is basically the thing that somebody will end up um, experiencing homelessness because they have no support network. And so I'm wondering what you think, why that started, where is, where is that breakdown in community coming from? Because it's pervasive across almost everyone that I've talked to and um, all the research that I've seen. So a couple of questions there. One is about rent control. The other one is uh, kind of the breakdown in our community that maybe have gotten us, has gotten us to this part. Go ahead. However. No oh, I, I don't know if I have a real good answer for the rent control, so I'll look into Mark. Yeah, I can start if we want to go in, in order. I think, um, uh, you know, as I said, rising rents are, are we're seeing this, you know, I should do it this way. Um, <laughs> uh, rents are going up this much, and I think, I think we saw, um, I think it's 60% since 2010. I think I saw that in the paper yesterday, and then home prices an even sharper incline, 75% or something. Um, so it's harder, harder to get housing, uh, to get into rental housing, and getting further, home ownership is getting further and further away for too many people. Um, that the same, the same chart um, is the, the unsheltered homeless pop, pop, population in the city. We're seeing it, you know, it's about 50% just in the last three years has, has increased. Um, and so I think there's no doubt that there's a, there's a parallel um, or that there's a cause and effect. Um, it's, again, it's not the only cause. Um, uh, but the effect is there, and it's on people and, and people experiencing homelessness. So um, I think we need to try a, a number of different things. I feel like the city council, despite that ban that the state has on it, and I think there's a possibility that that, that could get lifted if, if things changed in, in Olympia. Um, but we've been waiting on that for a long time. So um, I think the city council's done a pretty creative job of trying to find different solutions to, you know, recently... Um, uh, ensuring that landlords are not um, uh, restricting people based on their criminal histories um, into getting into units, because we know, actually, this is a little bit counterintuitive for most people, but we know that um, a, your criminal history is not, a, is not a predictor of whether you're a good or bad renter. Um, there's research after research that shows that. Um, people don't see that or believe that, and they're, they're scared, and there's fear that comes into it. But So the city, I think, has done some good things um, within the parameters of the existing law. And then as far as community, do you? Sure, I can speak to the community a little bit. Um, so I think community breaks down for people because of all the systemic reasons we've been talking about um, in, in you know, intergenerational homelessness and, and all of that. And so I think personally, networks break down for all sorts of reasons. Um, but then I think we as a community fail are most, the most vulnerable among us, often because of fear. And we fear the things that we don't understand and that we don't know, and that's why we advocate for proximity, for coming close. Um, because the closer you come, the more you feel, and the more you feel, the more you act. Um, oftentimes when people come to us, um, and, and they come you know, guns blazing, really angry about um, an encampment that's come near their child's school or, or whatever it is, it's often a fear driven by misunderstanding or a lack of knowledge. Um, and I think, I think we can embrace the most vulnerable among, among us, and I think we have to. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Hi, I'm Cassandra. I am corporate HR by day and an avid volunteer by night. Um, and so one of my questions was really, and actually you kind of spoke to it a little bit, but just around the concept of fear. So we talked about some of the myths around people experiencing homelessness and in terms of just the need to kind of get the community engaged on an individual level. And I know that fear is definitely a barrier. And so what are some practical steps that people can do to kind of overcome that outside of getting close, um, particularly if they've had um, poor experiences in the past? And what are some of the fears that are founded, um, such as um, mental illness or um, things like that? What's, what's founded and, and what's a myth? 
Well, I would invite you to come and um, volunteer at my organization <laughs> because I think that's um, what I've seen as a very powerful way to get to know the beautiful homeless community that's out there is by the proximity thing. And sometimes um, it just means just being comfortable around someone who is experiencing some mental health and some mental health instability. Um, I know that um, I, you know, all of us who work in homelessness, we, we, we do have to like learn about it. And I think that's the other piece is education is, um, you know, understanding uh, someone who is experiencing some psychosis and how to talk with someone. You know, I, I get to interact with someone who every day is hearing voices and um, he will come up and talk to me and tell me and the other day he he was mentioning you know me you know like I'm I'm really sorry I'm really sorry but I'm you know I hear these voices and my heart just broke for him because someone out on the street would see him you know talking to himself and he often is like uh, uh, kind of doing this weird kind of look with his body and but he is he was suffering and and I, I got to experience that suffering with him because I got to know him. And it happened because he's in my organization and, I, and I'm, I'm there every day. But um, I, I think if there's um, anything I can, encur can encourage is just to, to show up and volunteer and, and talk to people and don't be afraid of that person who seems like they're maybe um, having some kind of um, a, a problem. Because often just a, a quiet hello, um, I see you, can just change that person's perspective. So um, yeah, that's a little bit of my story and how I and I know that other folks okay. have good yeah, answers. I, I'd say on the, on the veteran side, a lot of times we get stigmaed with PTSD. And yet I see it every day because they went to Warrior Project. That is all we deal with people that are post 9-11 veterans that have gone to war and have an injury. I'm a combat veteran. I I'm, went to the 2nd Ranger Battalion. I've deployed plenty. My job was to go fight. I was trained in my mind to deal with it and compartmentalize it. Then, yeah, sometimes we deal with it 10 years down the road. But there are a lot of other veterans that are not combat related. I met a medic in Iraq that watched the Humvee blow up. He ran over to go help out, and he became catatonic and froze. His brain said, I've seen too much of this. I will save myself, and I will shut down. He was like a computer that froze when we all go to win out, and we can't get out of our windows because it's stuck. That was him. I had to pick him up and carry him off. And he's a medic, he wants to save lives, but he couldn't because his body froze from just seeing so much gore. So not everybody that you see is gonna flip out and, and shoot up your school or, or your building or tear up your apartment. PTSD is because some people are not geared for combat. Their roles were to be phlebotomists. Their roles were to be to supply routes. But when you get into a combat zone where we don't have lines anymore, they're getting engaged and so it's not their typical role. It's not a cook's role to go to Iraq and say, oh look, we got an awesome chow hall to give it out by contractors. And then we say, hey, I need another body. I'm going to give him a rifle. Let's go. He, his mind was meant to go make cakes. It wasn't to go kick it indoors. So not everybody is traumatically going to flip out and, and spaz out and shoot up a place. It's just taking a couple of minutes. If we can go on the internet and surf up a brand new recipe to make when we get home, we can surf up another website of a nonprofit and see a little bit more about stories. We all do it all day on our phones, right? It takes 10 seconds to go look up another internet and be like, oh, look, another story about a veteran. Because I look just like the rest of them, and you couldn't spot one veteran from a human being. We're just humans at the end of the day. Anybody want to add anything to that? I would just add that we, we all live better when we feel loved. Mm. And we can show that in very small moments. Like, just show up on your commute mm. to work every day. Like, just take the earphones out and just smile at people who are experiencing homelessness. That is a way that you can show that person love and acknowledge their humanity and give them a piece of the dignity that they have lost. Mm. We hear so often from people that the most disheartening part of being homeless is the first time someone steps over you. It's so dehumanizing. And I, I didn't always reach out and say hello. It's only when I started working at Facing Homelessness that I truly transformed my philosophy and approach, and I did it slowly, just by first engaging with people who were flying a sign, asking for money, people who were already engaging with the world around them. And then I became a little bit more comfortable smiling and saying hi and engaging with people who were more reserved. And it'll just be your own journey. Um, but just start it. Just start the journey. I feel like, what do you have to lose, too? You know, like, it's really, it's not unsafe. 
it just takes a little bit of risking your kind of emotions. I was on the bus driving, or riding back home with my son the other day, he was younger, and this um, gentleman who was experiencing homelessness asked me if we could borrow my phone, and I said no, you know, I had my son with me, and um, I said, but you know, so, you know, I can't help you today, but you know, have a good day. And I saw the kid, well, not a kid, a young man, an African-American male, um, who was probably 18 to 20 or so, um, this, a man experiencing homelessness asked him if he could use his phone, and um, the, the, the kid, he seemed like a kid to me, <laughs> he, he, he said yes, and he handed him the phone, and then um, the, the gentleman didn't proceed to call anybody, he actually looked up some kind of YouTube music video, and um, they started listening to music together, and just hanging out, and I looked, I looked at my son, and I said, yeah, that's the way we want to be. We want to believe the best in everyone, even if they're experiencing homelessness. We want to show love as much as we possibly can. It was a beautiful moment. Thank you. Hey, hi. Thank you. Um, my question is, I, I have a problem with wording. We're talking about homelessness, and I feel like what we really have is a refugee crisis. We have people who are economically not able to rise above the situation that they're in. Um, after going to California where it's flat and warm, you see people who really don't have a way to get out of their situations. I mean, I'm privileged, I've got a great life, and I struggle with like walking through life sometimes. So um, I love everything that we're saying, but sometimes I have to say that I think that we may be tapering down the actual issue, which is we're in an economic thing where it's great that we're all like being kind and reaching out, but ultimately, how are these people going to get out of the position that they're in? You, thank you so much. What you've done for this country, now you've came back and we, we you know, it really is an economic thing that I feel like we're not addressing, you know? And homelessness, <clears throat> and we do nice, generous, offers to folks, but ultimately, I just, most people just want a toilet, a place to live, and these gestures that I give and we all give, they're great, but we need to change the system that has failed them. And um, I don't want to minimize anyone's <clears throat> enthusiasm, but we have to address what really has happened. This is not, this is like, putting a Band-Aid on making us all feel good. And we all, I mean, I go out and I walk in my life and I'm, I feel really good, I do my real change. And when I buy my paper, <laughs> they're giving me so much more than what I'm giving to them. And I don't want to minimize what we're doing as people who are conscious and aware, but <sighs> I just, I don't know how to address it because it is a refugee crisis. It's uncomfortable. But this is no different than Syria. These people are not going to rise above where they're at just because we're being nice to them. Mm -hmm. um, it brings up a good point, you know, in the struggle of all this. Yeah. There's a, can I give you an answer real quick? Um, for what she's talking about, I, I've learned a lot in the last four years. I didn't know much about how the civilian sector worked whatsoever. I do government contracts, how to make millions of dollars getting a government contract, making an app or something. But I've learned from when the when Warrior Project, I've never been exposed to nonprofits at all. We are a little bit different than most nonprofits where we chose to not take any grants, any government federal funding. We got beat up on the news for it last year because people didn't understand how to read a tax document and we failed at making the tax documents correct. But what I did learn was when we have a nonprofit that's fully funded by donations, 100% donations, I had the ability to take a credit card and put a guy in a hotel to stabilize him without any red tape. Now with other, these other nonprofits, I'm not sure how you're funded, but if the community and these other companies want to help out, Help build a structure for a nonprofit to have money. Because our old CEO told us, and I heard it one time, and it stuck with me. It is great. You want to save a dog, you can go to pet code, you can get a dog, you can save two or three. If we want to take care of the canine race, or what we're going to do is try to take care of the veteran population, we need funding. And so we chose to market, advertise, go on TV, get money in nonstop. We got beat up for it because people didn't know how we spent it. And we put it out in the wrong, wrong brackets in a tax document. But nonprofits can't have lots of capital to do work if it's not tiered with that guy, but only if he's got a Nike shoe and, and it can be only a left shoe, because that's how the grant was written. If you have the funding just coming in, in the streams of it, and you are still controlling what you do with that money and we're reporting it correctly, we have the ability to make an impact. 
You know, we took it, when the Warrior Project, I'll make it short. This has not happened in America. We've got $100 million that we put up front and ponied up and said to four hospitals, all right, here's $100 million. What do you guys got? We want four hospitals to talk to each other to fix PTSD, TBI, and MST. Never has ever been four universities partnered up together to say, we will do that, we will work on it, and we agree to not write any paperwork on it. That was our stipulation. We're going to chuck $100 million in. If we don't, we're taking it back. But we got four hospitals to chuck in the extra piece of money that we wanted to, and they agreed to say, we're going to fix this and not write dissertations and magazine articles, because that was what we pushed, because we had the ability to have that money up front, like you were saying earlier with the cities. Hey, there's $100 million. Who's got to come to the table? And it worked, because it was our money we were backing it with. So there, there's a possibility there to make some change. Hi, um, my name is Heather. Um, I have a bit more of a specific question about the block project. Um, so currently I work at UW on a small part of the state targeted response to the opioid use ep epidemic in Washington state. Mm -hmm. um, and when you were talking about the block project, it got me thinking, wondering um, how you go about identifying people who are appropriate candidates for this housing project and if you have exclusionary criteria like opioid use disorders or any sort of substance use disorder and um, if you, you know, allow people who have had a substance use disorder in the past and like how you deal with things like um, relapse and if it becomes a legal issue and, and uh, those types of things if someone is living on, you know, someone's private property. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a good question. Also, you had to work with the city on this, right? Didn't you, to, in order to make this happen? We had to work with a lot of partners on this. <laughs> um, a lot of people have made this happen. So, um, so in short, to answer your question, um, the block project is as low barrier as we could make it. And then what we do is we empower the host to define their own barriers. Um, we, so we don't exclude um, drug users. We, drug users need to be loved just like all the rest of us and they need housing certainly. Um, there's drug use, illicit drug use is not allowed in the block home or on the property um, to protect the block project facing homelessness in the host. Um, but drug users are not excluded. Um, the host and the resident, when they come to the program, complete profiles. The resident does so with the help of a case manager. Um, and case managers are educated about the block project and referring clients in who they believe will be a good fit for this integrated solution because we know that it is not the solution for every person. Um, and um, so hosts and residents are matched based on compatibility. So if a host has indicated that they're not comfortable with someone who has a history of drug use, then someone with a history of drug use won't be matched with them. Um, there are some other exclusionary um, factors that we've had to integrate, um, mostly due to insurance. Because we're not public housing, we actually can't house people with violent criminal um, histories. Um, we, that's just a barrier that was given to us. Um, per insurance. Um, and then in terms of partnerships and working with the city, um, we're actually, block homes are built under um, DADU zoning, so detached accessory dwelling unit, um, which is something that we have in the city of Seattle that allows you to build um, kind of mother-in-laws or backyard cottages. Um, and the city has helped so much um, in um, expediting the permitting process and make, giving us connections to the health department to approve our off-grid systems and working with the building department, it's the, the support of the city has been nothing but positive. So a lot of hoops there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you all so much for being here. They're gonna yell at me that you're not in the light. <laughs> um, my name's Olivia and I'm working with the Housing for All Coalition. And um, I wanted to thank Colleen at the beginning for challenging us to think about um, the systems and institutions that have gotten us to the situation. Um, so our coalition is asking the city council to change the way they're addressing the homelessness crisis by um, increasing affordable housing, expanding shelters and services, and very important, stop criminalizing people for being poor and living on the street. Um, so I'm wondering if there are any other systemic changes you see need to be made and um, how we can get those rolling. Thoughts? Well, um, I'll take a, a quick um, try at it. Um, you know, Within the Native community, we have had 
system after system after policy after policy that has failed us. I often say to or people I'm talking to, is like, why would Native people trust another government system for housing? Why? We're smart people. <laughs> we're not going to. We're not going to keep going and falling into these traps. Um, and, but that is why it's been very important for me and for other people in my organization, the Chief Seattle Club and the Coalition to End Urban Indigenous Homelessness, to uh, in some ways in, infiltrate these um, boards. I'm on a million boards. I'm, on, I'm trying to influence policy as much as I possibly can because it is a passion of mine. And I think that for people of color, we experience, who, who are in, people of color who are in this advocacy world, we experience it in a different way. Because, I mean, I had people that grew up in my household who are sleeping on the streets tonight. It, it is a different kind of way that we feel it. And so um, I do everything I can to show up wherever I possibly can and, and share this um, information. And I, and I really appreciated the comment earlier about, you know, it can't just be about love and kindness. Um, I wish it could be, because I, I, I love that thing. I want to do that. <laughs> um, but if we do not address the system, systemic policies that encourage poverty, that encourage um, people of color not being at the table, then we will have a problem. So I think that um, I, I'm seeing some really amazing stuff happening at the city. The RFP application process for the homelessness money, it should not be overlooked. It is big deal. It hasn't been open in like, I don't know, 12 or 15 years. And so that means that organizations like the coalition, which has only started in the past three and a half years, we were not eligible to apply for this money because it was already all tied up with other organizations that you know, had it year after year after year. So we were able to apply for a really, for us, a big chunk of money. Um, I, I had a, a one night where I was, you know, I think it's 36 million, or no, I'm sorry, 50 million. And I, I looked, I looked up, leaned over to my husband in bed like 11.30, I'm like, um, what's 6% of 50 million? <laughs> because we're 6% of the homeless population. Native organizations should be owning that money and providing the services like we know how to do to the other, many of the other organizations are, are doing, are trying and doing a good job, but they're not culturally um, competent enough to do it. And we want that sacred responsibility back to take care of our relatives like we always have done prior to colonization. So that's how we're going to be doing it, changing those systems and policies and structures and making sure that people of color are at the table to make the decisions on behalf of our relatives. I think there has been more of an effort now to make sure there's results in money that is given out, right? So, yeah, that's part of it. That's Interesting right. pillow talk you have with your husband there, you know? So, yeah. All right, yeah. Uh, I know, I know. Can I, can I answer one more yes, part aspect to that question? I think on the systemic um, side, there's a couple of things, and I'll be real quick. One is um, we see way too many people um, that are exiting, I mentioned this before, but exiting prison, but also exiting treatment, um, exiting foster care, exiting these other, these other systems and becoming, um, becoming homeless. Um, and that's, um, so, the, so the, our homelessness crisis response system has become this place where, you know, Gary was talking about people need to become homeless, spend a couple of nights in a shelter in order to get housing. That shouldn't be the, the case. We're trying to be responsive to people that are already homeless and get, get people out quickly, but we need the Department of Corrections and, and DSHS and, and the federal government to really take care of people, make sure that they, they have a pathway out of those systems and, and don't become homeless. Um, I think one other thing is that um, there's a $70 billion housing program in this country um, that does not go to low-income people. It goes to moderate and high-income people primarily, and that's the mortgage interest deduction. Um, and that, that program, um, for anyone that owns a home, um, gets a nice deduction. It's an average of about $1,000 for people that you can deduct from your taxes. Um, and we, there's about a two billion, the homeless program um, nationally is a $2 billion program. Um, if you're a homeowner, um, that's a, it's an automatic entitlement uh, if you own a mortgage. If you are a renter and you can't afford housing, you get in line. Um, and I think those, those are some of the systemic things we need to change. Hi, uh, Robert McKay. Um, so I wanted to pick up on a couple of things that have been said. Um, I also work with Housing for All Coalition. Um, 
And I, I guess uh, sort of the question of scalability is one, right, of kindness and inner, you know, private changes are lovely and do it yourself is lovely on the block or whatever. Um, scalability, I have some questions about it, right? So I'm interested in very specific kind of uh, where you guys stand on some of these policy questions about building public housing, uh, how to fund it, right? Um, rent control, how to do it, get around the legal pieces if it's worth going that route. Um, and in terms of sort of inclusion and, and who's, you know, decision making and power, um, really appreciate what y'all are saying, you two over there, I don't know your names, um, about coming, you know, having, coming sort of from sort of frontline communities, right, and, and working within these uh, philanthropic and, you know, sort of social services systems. Um, I mean, I guess I would just propose kind of to everyone here, uh, like, that mass movements are also a space where people come together across class and race lines, right, and, and push for, um, you know, policy change, right, uh, that's, you know, can sort of hopefully synergize with these more, you know, inside the system approaches, right, which I have great respect for, but um, I think, uh, I, I wonder what your, your thought is about um, sort of popular mobilizations, like the one that brought us kind of the income tax recently, and that'll keep pushing for that, um, in bringing more resources, right, maybe asking Jeff Bezos, you know, for some philanthropic stuff, but also maybe changing the tax structure, right, so that there's just uh, some good old uh, forcible redistribution, right, toward these kinds of things, um, uh, you know, and, and public housing specifically and rent control specifically. Yeah. Anybody want to take that? Thank you. Sure, I'll jump into it because I'm probably the least qualified person here to answer that question. <laughs> uh, but hey, to me, sometimes that uh, gives you a better idea. Yeah. I just had a conversation the other day about, you know, we could take $10 million and try to build three buildings that's going to house 60 people. Or I could just look right now and say, if I can take that $10 million and buy five existing already be owned complexes that are kind of not really completely filled to the max, say, hey, landlord, I'm going to buy this place. We're going to guarantee it's going to be full. You're going to accept the HUD vast vouchers that could possibly continue to regenerate its own money as long as I'm promising not to spend it on my own good. But how can we start with something that we already have today? Building is great. It takes a little while, though. Um, there's another place. There's a place in Washington that I've seen that they built up for veterans that they say, hey, once you get into there, you don't have to leave. Great concept, and I love the facility. But at the same time, I can guarantee that's probably full by now, and that means nobody else can live there. So how do we find more things that are already out there that are not being filled in yet and maybe start that quick? I'm going to buy that. We're going to own it, let you run it. But here's the money. We're guaranteed it's never going to be empty. And then we get guys into there. And then we can get them into there. Maybe we can get them back to work. Um, so for, for me, at least, it's kind of like sometimes I start with what's in front of us instead of thinking about a bigger idea of making a new spaceship. So. Hi. Um, my name is Simone Barron. And um, I just recently moved to the university district. And um, I pretty much face homeless people every day. Um, as a matter of fact, I've had several run-ins with a lot of homeless folks, um, one of which was a very sick person who was physically ill every night sleeping outside of my apartment building. Um, and also another person that um, was just crying for help on a daily basis as I was going to work. Um, and we were talking, or you guys were talking about stewardship of the community um, embracing these people, which I think is a great idea, but how can we do it? Um, many times I've tried to help them in my own way, whether it's calling services, um, just somebody to help because they're sick. And I've only been told by every place I've called, you have to call 911. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they don't want the police there. A lot of times they don't want to go with the people. Um, or they'll do a wellness check where the police are very apathetic. They don't spend more than 40 seconds. They're just, mm -hmm. you know, flashing a flashlight to make sure they're alive. Right. Um, you know, in two days, they're not alive. Yeah. And I've seen that in yeah. a very short time. Yeah. So I just wondered, what would you propose for us to do as citizens in community when we are asked to help these people? Because I don't see, I don't see any services going out there on a daily basis and talking to mm -hmm. these folks and trying to help them. But I do hear that there's a lot of help to be had, mm -hmm. but I feel like there's a big disconnect between the people who need it and the help that's actually there. And I have tried my best to be sort of a link there, but I wondered if you had any ideas on how to do that. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I've got a lot of answers <laughs> to this question, and it's a, it's a good one. And I think that one thing that we haven't talked about in this conversation is trauma. 
Now, many, many, you spoke about it somewhat, and, and, and if you are homeless, you've had an incredible amount of trauma. And, and, and you're just, it's just trauma being homeless. And probably the, many of the reasons you got there was because of the trauma that you've experienced. We experience, and, and those of us who work day to day within homeless advocacy and, and um, providing you know, services, we experience trauma every day because of exactly what you're saying. Because there is a, a, a self-determination um, that is part of all social work. If that client, if that, in my case, a member, a relative, does not want that service, we cannot do anything. We, had some, we have that happen all the time. Police officers experience it. It happened today, I saw, a, a compassionate officer trying to get someone to go to Harborview because they needed the medical care. And if let's say, unless on their own you know, volition, we'll, we'll say, agree, you cannot force that person to do that. What can you and I do? is we can, be, um, we can be kind, we can offer, you know, I've, I've had people offer blankets, offer like just some easy things that I will go to Starbucks and buy you a hot drink. I will try to help make this easier for you. But it comes to a certain point within a, someone's individual rights to want to experience that, that we cannot, we can't cross. And that is always, always because of the trauma that they have experienced and because of, what, of, of, the, of the, the stuff that's going on in their heads and minds. So I really appreciate the question because it's something that frustrates providers extremely. The providers in the city are some of the most amazing people who will, will go out constantly, day and night, like trying to, to help people who need it. But unless that person is willing to do it, often our hands are tied. I know King County has, I'm not sure how many people you guys know that King County does have a mobile medical van. Yeah. And it's been in numerous conversations at different places we've talked about it. I think it's a great van. Mm -hmm. I just don't see it out very often. It doesn't make it very far north. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to let people understand, when you put somebody further out, you're going to put them out in Issaquah. You're going to go out there once. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be enough. And the ROI isn't immediate. People want immediate ROIs. Sometimes you have to take a leap of faith and say, we're going to be out there and put it out. I will be in Bothell. The mobile medical van will be here every Thursday, 9 to 11. And yes, you're not going to get much for the first few months. But if you continually be there and you're still going to be that beacon light and you promise and you fulfill your promise, people will start to come. And I would hope that we could have more of those, maybe smaller ones. And you can set them around. And then as long as you're around and your promise is fulfilled that we will be here from these times, these days, I think people would start to come out more. But we can't do it on just, we're going to go to Bothell one day of the year. We're going to go to this thing right here. Mark, you want to be continuous? We both, go ahead. <laughs> and you being there is so meaningful. We, we are all, including myself, we are all fixers. But you don't have to fix the problem. Your presence, just being with that person, is enough. And it's not that we at Facing Homelessness don't believe that systemic change is necessary. We do. But we know that our systems and our government and our politicians are only a literal reflection of us mm -hmm. and of our values. And we can't change our systems without doing the hard change of, without doing the hard task of changing ourselves and changing our priorities and changing our hearts. And that is why we believe so strongly in the grassroots model. And I just want to give you thanks for what you're doing because I know that it feels like you're running up against a brick wall. And that is what service providers feel every day. And it's certainly what people who are homeless experience daily. But the fact that you are there in a presence and standing with that person is so meaningful. And I just want to add um, to that that there, there are things, um, I guess I'd start with saying 911 is often the option because um, the, the largest force of, of city employees that are out on the streets and in the community are police officers. And we don't have that same kind of army of, of um, outreach workers. But we do, have a, we do have outreach workers. We have outreach workers that get to every part of the county. They don't get there every day and they don't get there um, in every, at every moment. And there's not a, a, a number like that where you can just you know, kind of on call have somebody respond. I wish there was. I, I, I do really too. wish and there I, was because it's, it yeah. just seems to me that there's like extra steps that you have to take to connect people in need with the services that they need and there's yeah. a lot of um, time gap between we, that where people just kind of don't get what yeah, they need. I, I, for them, right? And so we yeah. don't have, we need treatment on demand. Yeah. We, people who are, who are saying they want to go into treatment, they need to have, they need to do it 
we need to have that available and say yes then. Yeah. And so get, you know, being able to say yes when they say yes to, to wanting to go into services is essential and we're not there and we don't have enough resources and that's where we need, we need community support and, and grassroots efforts um, to really make movements to make that make that happen. I will say a couple of other things, just um, there's 211 is a line that, you, that people experiencing homelessness or people in need of any sort in our county um, can call. People can call on, on their behalf if they, if they allow that um, and there's somebody on the other line um, that's operated through the, the crisis clinic. Um, and, and then there are regional access points. There are service providers all over the county. We have more than 80 nonprofits working um, with people experiencing homelessness, but then there are five regional access points for, uh, for services for people experiencing homelessness. People can go there and apply for um, to employment or housing, um, and they're in um, Federal Way and Renton and uh, Central District and North Seattle and in Bellevue. Thank you. Yep. All right, you get to wrap it up. Come on up here. Okay. Uh, my name is Rob. Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, I, oh, I'm sorry, pardon me. Uh, I've had the honor to work with some of you on this panel or to refer clients to you guys. Uh, I work with people on the streets and um, at least my experience has been that the people that work for the city are doing an amazing job, that the people that work for the relief organizations in the city are doing an amazing job Trauma is absolutely right on b both sides. It is so, so, so hard to be on the streets and to try to help someone on the streets. You connect with these people on an individual level every day, and it is heartbreaking. I mean, the, the toll that it takes on the service workers and on the relief workers is immense, um, but the care is so, so, so profound. Um, one thing that I've been trying to do, just to to keep that hope alive a little bit. Um, we are in the realm of Amazon around here and uh, the private you know, corporations do have a lot of funds. I think they're oftentimes antagonized. I, I try to approach it with love and I've been trying to just go directly into the offices and ask, okay, you know, there's five to 7,000 people that aren't gonna be able to find a home this winter, maybe we do have something like a refugee crisis. Um, you know, these people aren't even gonna be able to get into a sh shelter. Do you think maybe big old Jeff would be interested in helping out? Where could I go within your organization um, to just at least start to try to ask these questions? I was referred to, I think, the sponsorship office, the PR office, and Jeff at Amazon.com. I'm still working through the process, but we talked a bit about trying to invite that uh, private corporate community like we would invite uh, you know, a, somebody with a home and a backyard who could put a block house back there, like we would invite any other part of the community into this, into this cause, um, into helping out people on the streets. And I was wondering what your experience has been like um, you know, trying to invite the, the corporate community into this, um, how easy it's been to access, you know, a, a corporate community, um, maybe collective efforts, um, how things have worked, you, you know, with, in, in terms of antagonizing versus trying to approach that community, which is so often antagonized with love because you know, when it comes down to it, I think Amazon owns one fifth of the property in this city. That might be wrong, but I'm, that's what I heard. Um, and they have the funds. So yeah, okay, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap, wrap it up. What do you think about that? Well, I, I said, or I, yeah, I think those that's are great a good questions. Hey, <laughs> I, I, I said earlier that um, I feel like the, the corporate community and our philanthropic community um, ha has done a lot and has a rich history of contributing um, resources, it, it doesn't feel like enough, and particularly when we see the numbers sometimes of the billions um, that, that, uh, that some of our, our local residents have, I think there's always those questions. Um, we've seen some of the organizations step up. We're trying. Um, we've had a lot of different conversations. They've come, they've come to us. They've come to nonprofits, um, to, 
to make donations, the work that Amazon's done with Mary's Place, or uh, Paul Allen and Vulcan with Mercy Housing and with Compass Housing. So there, there are examples, and I think we want to just continue to encourage that and have them encourage each other um, to continue to kind of one-up each other and do more, because there's, there's a lot more need. All right, what, I think you get the last question, though. All right. Well, sorry, it's not a very complicated one, but um, I to kind of follow up on the question of the, the woman that was up here before, two people before. Um, so there are five centers, I think you were saying. What are they called? How, is that through two-on-one or...? Yeah, it's, uh, they're called regional access points. Regional um, access and points. And you can find out information on King County's website, actually, if you, if you um, search King County and coordinated entry for all. Um, so that's the way to access housing, but those regional access points also have other, other services available there. So I, I think she brought up a really good point. If we are going to help people, maybe, you know, we all need to know what the access points are, how to, mm -hmm. so 211 is a crisis clinic, mm -hmm. um, and then regional access points are ways to get in people in touch with the resources that are available. That That's correct? right, and then there are outreach workers and staff at, at different agencies that have um, a lot of the same tools that those mm -hmm. regional access points have, so there, there are lots of points of entry where people can get connected to services. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, it's been a uh, eventful evening and a long evening uh, on a very tough, tough subject, let's face it, uh, because uh, it's not like you can just fix it. Uh, so, a lot of work that has to still be done and will probably take a while. Give you each 30 seconds to give me one final comment. Let's start with you. Uh, yeah, I, I'll make it easy. I probably talk way too much as it is. Honestly, I'd just say simply, we've got how many people here? Looks like about 60, 70 people. Go back to your community and start talking. Go to church, start talking. Go to work, start talking. Hey, I want this thing last night. These four people talked about some really cool pro programs and ideas. Just start talking. You do it, it'll spread. If you believe in what you're saying, you'll have passion when you come out of it, when you talk about it. It should hopefully incite somebody else to want to go do something else. So just start talking with your neighbors. Colleen? Um, beautifully said. Talk about it. And I think that, you know, as we talk about it and as you run into people uh, on the street, be aware of their trauma. Think about what they've experienced. Why are they there? What brought them there? And what is it like for them on a day-to-day -day basis to be homeless? It is not easy. It is incredibly hard. And, and, and encourage your empathy and your compassion and your love for people in that way. And then bring it down to City Hall and ask people to start making changes. You should, every time you're, we're in these kind of situations, you should say, hmm, the homeless population is mostly people of color. Where are the people of color? Who is making the decisions on behalf of them? And why aren't they represented in this panel? And be active in this um, amazing fight that we're in. Because it is, I do think that we can, we can, we can change the way that we have, the way we see homelessness in the city and that we can bring people inside. And I'm looking forward to that. Sarah? Do not fall into the trap of believing that this issue is too big to impact. I think that is, it's the stopping point for so many of us. When I first moved here, I moved here, I knew I wanted to work in the nonprofit sector and I literally said, just not in the field of homelessness, it's too big and I don't know what I could possibly do. And, and now here I am. Um, it, it will only change when we change and when we make each other a priority. So reach out with compassion, truly just say hello. It's not jargon, it's not, it really makes a difference and it's so validating and dignifying for people living outside. And think about the most beautiful parts of your life and imagine how you can open that up just a little bit and share that part of your life with someone who's living outside. Whether it's baking cookies and dropping them off to someone who you see every day on your commute to work, it can be anything and I'm happy to talk with you about what that could look like. Mark. What they said. Um, um, I, I also would add um, to the woman that asked about, you know, it's, a, it's, it's it, yes, we need to be kind to people, but like, God, there's these huge issues, and what, what do we do about that? Um, I think we're seeing that with a lot of different issues um, in the world today, and we can get overwhelmed. I get overwhelmed by what's happening in North Korea or Puerto Rico. Um, and I think, um, you know, live your values. Um, you know, day to day, but also, um, you know, be, be doing what you can, I guess, with, the, with those larger issues, um, not just your posts on Facebook, but actually taking some real action. And I think um, sometimes that is creating a movement. Um, sometimes that's just saying hello. 
Um, sometimes it's joining, you know, along with other people um, to make change. Um, so, you know, create the world that you want, right? Uh, please give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, this is a tough issue, very complex, as mentioned uh, in the beginning here, very challenging, um, and we can only just press ahead. Thank you all for being here this evening. We really appreciate it. And thank you to Mohai for uh, putting on these conversations that are uh, not easy conversations, but I think ones that we need to have in our community if we're going to uh, solve our issues or try to find some solutions to curb things. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. And uh, good night, everybody. <laughs>